Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And I'd like to thank you for coming to this press conference, press briefing. And uh, we've invited you to discuss a few areas as it relates to the Ghana Sugar Corporation. As you know that a lot has been happening in the sugar industry and in the corporation. And we felt that having not done a press briefing, a press conference for quite a while, that we have some information that we would like to share with the press in this way. Hence, we've um, called this press conference or organized it, so to speak. I'd like to introduce you to the members of the panel. They are to my immediate left, Mr. Paul Bim. He's the finance director and he's also the deputy chief executive officer. I'd like to, to Mr. Bim's left is Mr. Yusuf Abdul, and he is the technical services manager, general manager technical services. To my immediate right is Mr. Diodat Suku, and Mr. Suku is our chief industrial relations manager. And to Mr. Suku's right, that is, is Mr. Gavin Ramnarain, and he's the head of our Agriculture and Research Center. As you know, I am Adriana Thomas, and I am the Senior Communications Officer. This afternoon, we'd like to focus on three essential areas, and those are the up, to update you on the reorganization of Gaisuko. We'd like to focus also on the new business model for Gaisuko, as well as the transition process. So I'm just going to read some brief points that we have put together here, and then we are going to open the floor, so to speak, for questions from you. As you know, let's start with the update on the reorganization of Gaisuko. As you're aware, the state paper um, was tabled in Parliament in May, and that state paper, the white paper, as it is popularly called, is basically the government's position on the future of the sugar industry, Gaisuku. And so essentially, we'll be focusing on that's the basis from which we're going to be having this conversation this afternoon. And uh, so Gaisuko's focus moving forward will be on three estates. And those estates are Albion, Eiflet, and Blairmont. And all of this is in the state paper. Those are the estates that will be, so to speak, under um, Gaisuko. And uh, the other estates, which are Skeldon, Rose Hall, Wales, and East Demerara Estate, as you would know by now, the government has, has established this special purpose unit, and there's an advertisement that is currently out inviting investors to submit expressions of interest as it relates to divestment or diversification. And this is in relation to the Skeldon, Wales, East Demerara, and Rose Hall estates. As it relates to the new business model for Gaisuko, the new business model will basically include the three estates I mentioned, Albion, Blairmont, and Eiflet. Albion is going to focus on, the, on bulk sugar, plantation white sugar, cogeneration, and molasses. Blairmont, the focus will be on bagged and packaged sugar. However, Blairmont Estate has the potential for expansion in the event of um, the sugar prices um, becoming more favorable, particularly in our circumstances. Eiflet Estate will focus on bag and plantation white sugar. My colleagues will explain to you what is plantation white sugar. And um, the future at Eiflet, for example, Eiflet, an interesting model is, is evolving where we hope that cane farmers, more cane farmers, would become interested in Eiflet in terms of the cultivation of sugarcane. And Gaisuko 
could then focus on sugar production and managing the factory. So we are hoping that uh, more and more cane farmers from the West Demerara area will express interest in becoming cane farmers and uh, contributing towards the Iflot Estate Improvement Program. As it relates to, we, we made a point here on markets. We've been, as you know, part of the, the reason for the reorganization of Gaisuko for us changing our business model is as a result of, um, it's influenced by the markets. And uh, they, Ms. Bim is going to talk more extensively on that aspect. And uh, currently, I'd just like to mention that we still have um, some, to some degree, some protected markets, if I could put it that way, are preferential markets, Mr. Bim. And those are in CARICOM. Um, we have a small North American market. And of course, we supply the local market. The products for the new business model, so to speak, we say the new Gaisuko, will include raw sugar, plantation white, cogeneration, packaged sugar, bagged sugar, molasses, and bagasse. One of the things that you might have heard us talk about, and moving forward, we have to, Gaisuko is a business, and we have to eventually progress the corporation to a point where it is run and managed as a business. Hence, the whole question of, of um, improving the integrity of the value chain is important. And this is the value chain from the cultivation in terms of planting the, the sugar cane all the way to the production of the sugar, all the way to, to selling the sugar to our customers. So that's, as we talk about the new model for Gaisuko, we have to talk about the integrity of the value chain. Also profit, we hope that within three years, by 2020, <coughs> Gaisuko sh should become or could become an, a profitable business enterprise. Hence, reducing our dependency on government subvention. The, the other point that we'd like to talk about is the transition process. The transition process, as you know, Gaisuko is a large organization, 16,000 plus employees, and um, which also means 16,000 plus, um, 16,000 by five, because we like to think of, of our employees as members of families. They represent family, family units. And if you multiply that 16,000 by five, so the, any transition or any reorganization is a challenge. And uh, here, and this is where we are, part of the reason for this press conference is not just to have the media as a casual, um, have a casual engagement with the media, but to build a strategic partnership with the media because we have such a huge challenge that we are trying to deal with and you can help us to manage the change so that it's not, um, it, it is as smoothly as, it is rolled out as a matter of fact, as smoothly as we possibly can roll it out. And then, so hence we're talking about the reorientation of, of Gaisuko. We have to reorient the whole way we do Gaisuko. We do the business of sugar. And even as Gaisuko change its business model, all of the other businesses which are associated with Gaisuko will also have to change their business model, and that includes unions. So the, the other aspect that we're, we'd like to discuss is in terms of the competitiveness of the environment within which we're operating. We're operating in a very competitive environment as it relates to selling sugar. As you're aware, from the 30th of September, the EU um, reforms completely um, came to an end. Mr. Bim can talk a little more about that. Hence, the market or the environment has become a little more competitive. And Gaisuko has to be aware of that. Hence, the reason for the business model and we're um, challenging and, and calling our, on our stakeholders to
to also change their business model too. Whales, whales is a topical issue. Will, uh, Mr. Suku is going to deal with whales extensively in terms of those employees who were paid, um, or former employees, and I, we know that severance has also been a very topical issue. Mr. Suku is going to deal with the issue of severance. And uh, they, um, we, we're aware that just this week, we've seen a lot in the press where the, some of our, um, some persons from the Wales community, former employees and residents, were um, in the media claiming that they were not paid severance. Mr. Suku is going to explain that scenario. But what we would also like to say at this stage is that all of the employees who were, um, let's say, who were um, due for severance were paid severance. But like I said, Mr. Suku is going to, this is specific to the Wales issue. The IFLA tested is, there's also been a lot of press on IFLUT in terms of IFLUT improvement program. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you're aware, at, at all of our estates, we have a labor shortage. And hence, the reason for us encouraging some of our workers from Wales to go to IFLUT so that they can contribute towards the IFLUT improvement program. We can talk more about that in, in our discussion. Wales, as you know, Wales is one of the locations that was identified for diversification. That estate went out of sugar production in December of last year. They have since reaped their first crop of seed paddy. That was the first diversification venture that the estate had gotten involved in. And um, they're now moving towards uh, plant, starting planting for their second crop of seed paddy. And Mr. Bim will be able to tell you more about that in terms of um, how many bags were harvested the last, um, and other details surrounding that. We also like to say that because of the transition of Gaisuko, and I've mentioned the 16,000 plus employees as well as their families, we understand that there is going to be some degree of disruption. And hence, the corporation has established what we call an alternative livelihoods program. We've developed an alternative livelihoods program where we are looking at, it has two components, basically. One component, or three, I would say. One component is where we're, we have a number of contractual opportunities which um, contractors are currently providing those services to the corporation. So we're examining those opportunities to determine which of those might be available for employees, our employees, to become engaged in and provide us with um, services. Because some of the employees from the East Demerara Estate and Rosal Estate come the end of of December would be made redundant. So we're looking at what opportunities are there within the corporation as it relates to these contractual services so that we can uh, make those opportunities available to the employees. So that's one component of the alternative livelihoods program. The second component is where we're, we have a, we're looking at commencing a massive skills training program and uh, this is where we're, most of our employees would have worked in sugar in Gaisuko for most of their working lives, 20 years, 30 years, 10 years, 15 years. And so what, we've, what we're attempting to do in this alternative livelihoods program is to reskill our employees, those employees who would be made uh, redundant. So those who will remain with us, we will upskill them so that they can be involved in, in other areas as against specific to the tasks that they do. But the ones who will be made redundant, we're looking at examining how we can, or trying to determine how we can reskill them, retrain them basically. So, so far we've had, we've met with about 500 employees from Wales and the East Demerara Estate. 
and we have about 100 of them so far who have indicated an interest in being retrained. So we have employees, for example, we have, um, we have about 21 persons who've expressed interest in being retrained in areas like sewing, cosmetology, caring for the elderly. We have 26 employees so far who've indicated an interest in being trained in catering. We have 28 who've expressed an interest in being trained in masonry, carpentry, plumbing, mechanical and electrical works. 13 who are interested in small business management, management, developing business plans, developing, sorry, developing proposals. And seven who are interested in being trained in refrigeration, air conditioning, and computer repairs. Some have also expressed interest in being trained in AutoCAD, project management, information technology, among other areas. So the next step for the, um, for the Alternative Livelihoods Program would be to provide a comprehensive plan of the employees, what they're interested in, and, uh, the, and in terms of training. We're also building partnerships with training institutions and other agencies that can um, work with us to retrain these employees. Finally, what we've done too, we, we currently have some consultants also who are assisting us on how to transition employees into farmers. As you're aware that one of the commitment is to lease lands to employees who are interested in becoming farmers. So we have some consultants at the moment who are assisting us in determining what's the best way to do that. And then what we've recognized finally what we've recognized from the challenges um, which Gaisuko is experiencing is that many communities were, were vulnerable to the shocks from one industry. So we developed or we're developing what we call a sustainable communities program to determine how we can build more resilience into these communities so that they do not necessarily, we call them the sugar dependent communities. So we're looking particularly as, um, as a entry point, so to speak, for this program, the Sustainable Communities Program. We're looking at the Enmore and neighboring communities. This, these are the communities in the vicinity of the, or the East Demerara estate area. We're looking at the communities around the Rose Hall estate and the communities around Wales estate. So we've already conducted a study within these communities to determine from the residents, if you're not doing sugar, what else would you want to do? What are the other preferred areas of growth that you would like to do in your area? And what sort of skills and training do you need to achieve those growth areas? So those are some of the things that we are currently doing and we thought that um, we would like to share some of this with you. I'll now pause here for, to invite questions from you, but also before I do that, I'd like to invite my colleagues if they would like to comment on anything that I've said, or if they have something that they'd like to contribute to. No? Okay, so <laughs> we'd now like to open the floor for questions. from the Guyana Chronicle. Uh, you said that focus will be placed on um, the three estates, Albion, Blairmans, and Iflot, uh, and you're expected to make a profit, um, Gaisuko to be a profitable uh, company cooperation within three years. I'm wondering what is the, uh, how much sugar would be produced uh, for, uh, using those three as against what existed before, and the financial structure as to how many profit you hope to make, say, in the first year, the second year, and then the third year for it to be, you know, very profitable or profitable. I'll ask Mr. Bim to respond. Um, <coughs> in terms of the sugar production, um, for those uh, three estates, we're hoping to get up to about 150,000 tons of sugar. 
by 2020. Um, if we do um, expand, say at Blairmont, we should have another 10,000 tons of sugar or so more. And that's about it in terms of sugar production. But don't forget, we also have molasses, and um, we're looking at cogeneration at Albion in particular. There's a feasibility study on the way on that aspect of it. And um, coming out from that feasibility study, a decision will have to be made on that. In terms of the finances, um, profitability at the end of 2020 may not be. What we're looking to do is to become cash positive. By 2020, we are hoping to stop our dependence on the government for these um, subventions we, uh, we've been asking for. Uh, next year, and the, uh, that's 2018 and 19, we can see ourselves still needing a sub subvention from the government. But by 2020, we should be self-sufficient in terms of our um, cash. Thank you very much, Mr. Bim. But uh, just let me just add that um, <coughs> with the production that we've had in the past, about 70% of the sugar went to Europe. Now, as you know, the European price has dropped um, considerably. The preferential price was taken away uh, by 2009-10, it had gone. Right now, uh, the sugar we are selling to Europe, and we still sell a significant amount of sugar to um, Europe. This year, we probably will be doing something like uh, 100,000 tons of sugar. The world market price at this point in time is about 310 US dollars per ton. Now, if you think of when we had the uh, preferential price, on average, we were getting about 620, 600 dollars, US dollars I'm talking about, per ton sugar. So there's a huge decline, a huge disparity there in the price we were getting then and what we are getting now. Because of that, and in order to move away from the sale of raw sugar, with the three estates that are remaining, we're looking to maximize our revenue from the value-added sugar. That is sugar uh, sold into CARICOM, which is mainly bag sugar and packet sugar. The local market as well takes about 20,000 tons of bag sugar per year. And we also are looking to sell packet sugar in the local market. In addition to that, we have a small US quota of about 13,000 tons. Uh, the price is uh, similar to probably what you're going to get when the European price was pretty good. So we're going to look at, we're going to be satisfying that quota as well. So next year, we'll still be selling some amount of sugar into Europe at those very, very low world market prices. Hence the reason we are still going to be dependent on the um, government for, subs for uh, subvention. As we gradually get away from the um, raw sugar market and head towards uh, maximizing on the bagged and the packaged sugar, we're also looking at um, doing something called plantation white sugar. Now, plantation white is really a substitute for a refined white sugar. Imported into CARICOM annually is something like about 190,000 tons of re refined white sugar. Now, from the research we have done, CARICOM only needs about 10% of that refined white sugar the process to do whatever their soft drinks or the sweets or whatever. The rest of it could come from plantation white sugar. Now that is value added sugar. And if we are getting together with Jamaica and Belize, they're part of the SAC, the Sugar Association of the Caribbean, to press the CARICOM um, governments to grant us a CET, a common external tariff, where uh, white sugar coming in extra regionally, they're hoping some sort of a tariff will be imposed we are not sure as yet what, what percentage we are looking at. At the moment, brown sugar attra attracts a tariff of 40%. We are probably looking at something between 30 and 40% for, the for that to be imposed in order to make our plantation white sugar competitive. In relation to the reorganization, um, apart from the planting of seed, seed paddy at Wales, um, has any other thing happened? Um, that's one. Um, what else is intended to happen? Two. And three, um, how many workers have so far been laid off? Okay, Mr. Bim will answer the questions on what else has been done. And uh, the first and the second question, and Mr. Suku is going to answer the third question. Mr. Bim. Yeah, on the um, seed paddy project at um, Wales, we've just actually completed harvesting the 
forest 200 acres. Um, the yields weren't as we expected it to be. It was about 28, um, 28 um, acres. Oh, it 28 bags. Sorry? Bags. 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 28 bags per acre. Uh, we were anticipating about 35 bags per acre, actually, so we fell short quite a bit on that. We're actually, um, we are hoping to do 485 he uh, acres of land at Wales in seed paddy. So the 200 has been done already. We are going to replant. And then the 285 um, acres are, is just being uh, prepared. The land is just being prepared and leveled. And then we will be planting that to be reaped sometime in March next year. In relation to other um, diversification projects, we had a feasibility study on aquaculture, which has been completed. Uh, the studies did indicate that it's quite feasible to actually grow tilapia in Guyana. The trouble is it, it requires quite a bit of investment, I think something like 40 million US dollars. Now, and I know you're aware there's a special purpose unit which has been established to actually um, handle the uh, divestment of the estates that are going Diversity. and also the diversification aspects. So that project will now be handed over to the um, special purpose unit for them to actually attract investors to take to uh, get it going. We are basically going to concentrate on sugar production at the three estates we mentioned before. Mr. Suku will answer the question, how many um, employees have been um, <coughs> made redundant? Um, on Wales, let me just go back a bit. Um, Wales, quite a lot has been said about Wales. However, if you go back early, there were two two sets of tranches of employees who were severed. Uh, early last year and early this year. Uh, to date, the number is 389 persons. They've all been severed and they all received the final payment to severance pay from the company. Um, the rest of the employees who are the key harvesters and the support services, they were asked to work at IFLOT. And what we saw in the news is far from the truth. Um, during the last crop, about 18 to 20 turned out to work. They would have refused. But currently, there's about 140 who is working at IFLOT currently from Wales. Uh, you see the number increase. And we are still encouraging those other 200 because it's 350 persons who are asked to go and complement their workforce at IFLOT because uh, there's a shortage of labor at IFLOT. So the company have vacancy at IFLOT that could even take care of the, of the planters who refuse to go to IFLOT. So currently, 140 of those 350 have worked at IFLOT. Still there we can uh, You spoke about 16,000 multiplied by 5. But we've seen figures uh, that uh, says that it's about 60% turn out. Do we have 16,000 employees in the sugar industry? And second, uh, and I may have some more, if you forgive me. Um, Recently, you asked for $2 billion. Are you going to go very shortly and ask again? And what is it that we got so far from the government in terms of um, help this year? OK, Mr. Yeah, Suku is going to answer the first part of the question. And Mr. Bim will answer the second part on the subvention. Um, and, and the employees, you asked two questions. One, the number, 16,000, and the attendance. Um, the fact remained. Uh, we have time-rated and fish-rated employees. <coughs> Our operation is a seven-day operation in the cropping period. Employees are expected to work for seven days because opportunity existed for seven days. Uh, unfortunately, what we have is an agreement with the union that requires them to work 80% of five days, which is actually work out to four days. So those persons would have worked, uh, when you do the average, it is saying every 100, 40 persons in any one day stay home. Uh, they don't work. At the same time, we hear the concern that people are not getting earnings or whatsoever. However, our on roll is reflective of the numbers that we have on roll. Those persons are on are, are, are roll, 16,000, which also include, um, include the senior staff. So from the executive to the rank and file and the time rated, and the junior staff is 16,000, close to about 16,000. Those numbers are there, and each has said you can check them. Yeah, on the um, subvention issue, in 2015 we were um, we received 12 billion dollars from the government. 
16 uh, was 11 billion, and this year, this year we've actually received 9 billion, given a total of um, 32 billion. The 2 billion you spoke about, um, it's not another subvention, it's uh, land we're actually selling to the CHMPA, the Central Housing and Planning Authority. We are looking to sell more lands to keep the um, business going. This will be happening this year, uh, for the land sale for this year, next year, and the following year. Uh, this is in order to avoid relying too heavily on the government for these subventions. So we are looking at another two and a half billion, in addition to the two already, worth of land sales for the remainder of this year, to ensure that our operations continue and we uh, remain cash positive. A follow up, sorry, another question. Recently, the Prime Minister representative in Turkey, uh, Gobin Hadigan, uh, uh, reported that there may be some dumping of cane juice at Skeldon. Um, do you have those reports? Uh, there are indications that there was a report from a South African engineer uh, which was given to Guy Sukho's management of board of directors and there was nothing done about it. But it's, it's the point that was made that we are investing in the cane fields and spending a whole bunch of money on getting the canes down to the factory, that skeleton, and then because of um, capacity at the, the, the factory level, it is not, uh, they can't grind it or they can't keep it in the in the vats or whatever, and it's been dumped. Um, is this something that you're looking at? Have you been able to confirm? I'd refer that question to Mr. Yusuf Abdul, who is the general manager for the technical services. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, say that none of our factories we are allowed to dump any juice. That is a no for start. We cannot dump the juice. What has happened, you recall that at Skeldon we have the diffusion technology there. Outside of the conventional factories that we have, where we have milling, where the main extraction is from milling plant, but this is a diffuser. Uh, technology that we have, a new type of technology that is used internationally and in South Africa and Brazil, but we do not at no time dump any juice. What happens whenever we have problems, for example, at Skeldon, we will have problems that will last for a couple of days. And when you have the juices in the diffuser, it becomes so acid that the purities are so low. What this does is to slow the process in, in, in the sugar house. Well, we do not at no time dump any juice and none of the factories in Gaisuku. A follow up, uh, there, there is a policy not to dump juice. Have you come across any instances or incidents that where they would have to do that because of uh, what you say the acid, the acidic content. Yeah. Um, have you been able to put, put a value to that? No, we haven't really been put, uh, put to put a value on it. But as I said, that it is very, I can't recall when we have to do that. We do not, we do not dump any juice. It's policy that we cannot um, dump any juice because it's a loss of, of sugar. It's a loss to us if we do that. If I could may say at this point, Gaisuko is an interesting organization. And one of the things that we have found is that, I mean, I can say as a senior communications officer, very often when people write about Gaisuko, make public statements of Gaisuko, it, they're not necessarily true. And I'll give you an example. For example, we saw a lot in the media this week, they, some residents from Wales and some per claiming that the union, one of the unions, claiming that the residents, that our employees are not paid their severance and uh, residents were um, hence suffering as a result of that. And that is entirely not true. Like Mr. Suku said, the employees who were due severance were paid severance. However, they, um, so, for example, some of the persons we've seen in the media this week, their, um, em their jobs are awaiting those employees or the husbands of those persons, some of those persons who were in the media. 
at iFlood. They can take up their, their jobs. And Mr. Suku will tell you, had those um, employees taken up their positions at, or their jobs at iFlood, between January and August, they would have worked for over $100 million. And so uh, a lot of what is being, we would like to say, peddled in, in the media and in other spaces are not necessarily um, true as it relates to the corporation. I would just like to add something on the uh, $32 billion that the question was asked about. There's been a lot of um, letter writers, I think, and um, stories in the media as to where the money went to. I'll just give you an example, a couple of examples, actually. In 2015, uh, as I said, we received $12 billion. Our revenue that year was $19.6 billion. Our labor costs, employment costs, was $21.4 billion. So our labor costs in that year, when we received $12 billion from the government, was 21.4 as against the revenue of 19.6 billion. In addition to that, on an annual basis, we spent an average of about $2 billion on um, fertilizers, $2 billion on fuel, freight, where we, um, the shipping of our molasses and sugar accounts for another $1.3 billion. Uh, transportation of our workers with these labor lorries, uh, $1.4 billion. Um, we also, over that period, repaid the National Commercial Bank of Jamaica $2 billion. That was in an outstanding loan that we had with them. But just to carry on, in terms of the years, 2016, when we received $11 billion of, uh, from the government, the revenue was $20.9 billion revenue of sugar and molasses. Labor was $18.3 billion we spent on labor, so it was less than revenue. But the other expenditure sort of made up for the $11 billion. And then in 2017, that this year, that's this year, we are forecasting revenue to be about $17.4 billion and our labor costs at $18.5 billion. So our labor costs this year is again go going to um, exceed our revenue. And don't forget, we have the expenditure for fuel and fertilizers, the ones I've mentioned in the past, uh, recently. Those, those expenditures are still there. We still have the $2 billion in fertilizers, fuel $2 billion, uh, freight 1.3, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where the money is going to. I mean, um, the point is our labor costs are high. Um, it does account for about 92%, I think, of our unionized workers. Um, the labor costs go to them. About 8% goes to the senior staff. I would just like to add also on the question of with regards to the dump at uh, the juice at Skelton, right? And uh, in the first case, Skelton, you know, the capacity, we have not been able to utilize the full capacity of Skelton because it was designed to operate at a capacity of 350 tons skin per hour, hourly. We are actually, at this point in time, the most we have done is approximately 250 to 275 tons per hour. So we have the capacity, so there's no need for any dumping that can occur because the capacity is there. What really happened is that the, because of the capacity, what happens to us is that we lose a lot of sugar in the process due to inversion. Bacteria started to take over and we lost in the process, which we can't recover. Because as you know, in sugar processing, Ideally, what you want is continuous operation, but if you're going to have stop and start in the system because of whatever reason, whether it's a factory problem, whether it's a cane supply problem, whatever, you will have problems with losses, which we call also undetermined losses that you can account for because the sugar is lost in the process for bacteria inversion process take place. So, we, so there's not a problem, there's no need for any dumping of the sugar at any one of the factories, or the juice, dumping of the juice, at any one of the factories. I don't understand, you know. Yes, there was a South African who came there and worked with us. He assisted us, and he eventually ended up being a contractor to us. So I don't know. But in our, in, we, since that factory commenced operation in 2010, and yes, we had a lot of difficulties. 
in which we have been trying to correct the mechanical defects that we have observed by um, several works that we have done. A quick follow-up on that. Why did you not keep tell them in the whole scheme of things? Sorry, a quick follow-up. Why did we not keep skeleton uh, with the three other factories? Could you give us some reasons? Um, <coughs> I'm sure a lot of you know about the history of skeleton and the issues we have had with skeleton since it um, commenced operations. Uh, we spent about 200 million US dollars on skeleton. Well, just let me just add, there is this misconception that all of that went towards the factory. That's not true. Uh, 112 million US was the cost of the factory, and there was um, 6 million US, which um, was for the pond dumper. The rest of it was spent on the cultivation, in the cultivation. That was, that was to convert the, um, the land, the, the fields, into a mechanized layout, which is quite costly, and also buying a lot of equipment in terms of cane harvesters, uh, mechanized harvesters, and tractors, and a variety of other equipment. So, um, the $200 million, um, I, I'm not sure how much is known, is that um, there was a combination of loans. Um, $56 million came from um, the World Bank. Uh, 32 came from the Exim Bank of China. And 24 came from, um, 24 came from uh, the CDB. About $88 million out of that $200 million should have been... Um, coming from a f combination of land sales, land that we were going to sell, and Guy Suko's own resources. In the end, we did not sell the land. And um, the 88 million US dollars had to be funded from our own cash resources. As it is, at, at that time, the, um, the price in Europe, the preferen preferential price was still there. But at the same time, we were trying to fund Skeldon from our own resources, partially, the price was declining. So we were caught in terms of finding all that money for Skeldon, a declining sugar price, <coughs> and we were having also issues with production because in um, 2005 we had a huge flood, as you know, and our production declined from 300,000 to 245. So we were caught, everything came at one stage, and I'm afraid from then on our liquidity really began to slide, and um, things got um, increasingly worse. And we have really never recovered from that. And I just now, like in terms sorry. of uh, sorry, <laughs> in terms of not keeping Skeldon, being one of the estates um, earmarked to be sold, Skeldon still requires quite a big investment, both in a factory, the cogen plant, which is now um, run by SCI, still requires I think about 15 million US dollars million, yeah. to actually fix it. Our factory, the factory itself, requires some amount of uh, money again. But also there's a huge chunk of money that has to go into the fields. We never really finished the conversion process out of Skeldon, that is converting the lands to accommodate mechanized harvesting. And also now those e the equipment we bought, you're talking about them being about nine, ten years old. They have to be replaced. And Geisico just does not have the finances to actually keep that operation going. And that was the reason that, uh, that why it was taken to actually uh, divest Skeldon. I'd just like to make the point of both Mr. Bim and Mr. Abdul spoke about our production. And this is a little off from the Skeldon, the topic. And uh, one of our issues that we're having is as it relates to um, our production. We have an attendance issue. We've had issues, industrial relations issues, um, strikes, protests, and... Uh, when we talk about a new business model for Gaisuko, when we talk about improving the integrity of our value chain, we, and when we talk about our other, the other businesses or organizations which are associated with Gaisuko also changing their business model, basically the way they do their business, we are hoping that moving forward, some of the impediments to our business could be um, could be could be reduced, so to speak, so that we can our production can be improved, our ability to produce. I'd just like to ask Mr. Ramnerain to talk a little because ethanol has been a topic um, as to why Gaisuko is not focusing on ethanol. 
as an alternative to sugar production since the prices for sugar um, is so low. So I'd like Mr. Ramnarain to come in here. He's the head of our agriculture research and he can talk a bit about ethanol and why ethanol has not been a choice so far. Okay, yeah. thank you very much, sir. A couple of things about ethanol. It's been on the news and there's been a lot of people writing various letters, etc., on ethanol. One of the fundamental things that we have to understand is that the cost of production of the sugarcane plant in Guyana is very high. So your input is that cane plant to turn it into juice or molasses, etc., is very high. So if your input is high, the cost of your ethanol is also going to be very high. Now, there was a, a press release that Guy Sulpu did, I think, on the 11th of August. And in that press release, it went through step by step one of the, the rationales why we should not go to ethanol. It will be very expensive. The other thing is the studies. Guy Sulpu has done numerous studies since 2004, 2007, not just Guy Sulpu, but external agencies and independent consultants. And in all the studies, ethanol has never been as profitable as, as sugar. Currently with the price of oil, which ethanol is linked to the price of ethanol, oil prices are relatively low and look like they're going to remain low. The CE said um, a, a while back that if we looked at ethanol when oil was $100 a barrel and it did not make economic sense, it is highly unlikely ethanol will make sense at $50 a barrel. And this work has been done, it can, the studies can easily be found on the internet. Um, it does not make any sense at this particular juncture for Gaisuku to look into ethanol. And the main reason is the fact that your raw material of cane is produced at a very high price. I'd just like to say that you mentioned the sea, and I'd like to say the sea is, we call the chief executive officer, the sea, <laughs> so that reference. <laughs> So, there, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. And I just have a couple of questions. Um, in your projections for 2020, how many employees do you figure you'll need to get those three estates uh, going? And do, do you already have uh, revenue productions and expenses um, productions? Uh, regarding Wales, could you say what is the amount of the severance that was paid to all of the employees? Uh, to get, of course. And I'm interested in knowing what was responsible for the loss of yields as per your projection at Wales, 1,400 bags, if my calculation is correct. Could you also say where did the paddy go? Um, how much did you spend on developing those lands and what revenues you've been able to recover from it? Uh, could you also say what lands are available for sale to farmers that uh, you spoke about earlier? And could you also um, comment on what exactly are the contractual opportunities for uh, Former workers at uh, Enmore and Rose Hall. Mm -hmm. We may have to ask you to repeat some of those questions. The f what's the first question? The projections for 2020 in those three estates. Okay, Mr. Bim is going to take <coughs> that. Oh, in terms of the revenues and costs? Yeah, and your labor. Well, I think we are expected to have about 11,000 employees at, by 2020. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll leave there. That's easier to yeah. um, Relative to the employees, uh, it will be employees at Wales, at Albion, Blaymont, Iflat. Uh, we will also have at those three estates, uh, Wales, Rose Hall, and Eastham, skeleton staff manning certain stations, like the sluice, because they to serve the entire coast in drainage so we have to maintain the 16 pumps of these coasts so we have to have full complement and then those parts of whom is the bridge and the waterway in the back to see how free flow i don't cause flood in the village uh what we are looking at currently with the two estates is you, you will work out left it out skeldon uh close to 10,000 employees remaining in the industry three estates and the three estates uh in addition to those skeleton staff or those small estates um what uh, we also have to recognize is that uh, some of the employees of those estates, like the Rose Hall estate, are going to be closed uh, out of sugar and diversify. Uh, we, will we will try as much as possible uh, to utilize them uh, at the estate close in proximity to Rose Hall. Because the first option is to 
provide alternative duty and the last option is for severance. Uh, if you look at the attendance over the period, you would have recognized that over the years, Gaitika would have lost a lot of employees than he could have recruited over the period because uh, our recruitment process throughout the years has been reduced uh, because we are lost in skilled employees, senior staff, junior staff. and the rank and file employees. So from Rose Hall, we will be utilizing some of the employees uh, to go to other estates. Like what we did at Wales, uh, we utilized some of the employees from Wales because we had vacancy across a Thai plus. Um, for Wales, the severance, uh, as I said, 389 persons. And I know the number direct because um, uh, the value is $338 million. And yeah, Mr. Miller, if you, uh, could just Do you have revenue production uh, projections for 2020 to say that you will be, I don't know what's the term you use, expenses uh, neutral, because <coughs> you said uh, not yeah. profitability directly? We, I mean, the term is uh, cash neutral, right? Mm -hmm. We're we generating sufficient cash to actually run the business as opposed to dep dep depending on um, government mm -hmm. subventions, yeah. We have got the numbers. I mean, I haven't got them to a head here at the moment. But um, one of the things I must point out, in the assumptions we've made for 2020, we're still selling raw sugar or into Europe because we are looking at plantation white, but we're not absolutely sure when that will come on stream. A lot depends on if the CARICOM um, governments can implement the CET, the Common External Tariff. So we are still um, projecting to sell some amount of raw sugar into Europe, but if plantation white comes along before then, then the finances are going to look a lot better than what they're looking at at the moment. The reasons for the, um, the poor yields at, um, at, at Wales with regards to the rice. Yeah, um, you, you asked the question about the cost, right? No, we just start, we started rice there um, last year. Uh, there would have been some start of costs, particularly with the land, um, land preparation, land conversion, laser leveling, that sort of thing. Now, those costs will benefit us over a certain period, right? So you can look at it in the first year and say, right, it's made a loss because those start of costs will benefit you over a few years. Yes, it, I mean, it, it did make a loss last year uh, in the first crop that we've just done. But as I said, some of those expenditure will be spread over three or four years. Now, Mr. Sim, why the loss in yield? Oh, the loss in yield. Um, uh, Gavin, would you want to come in there, please? Well, I think one of, one of the reasons that the Remember, this crop just came in, so right now we're doing a diagnostic on why the yield is, is low. One of the things is no one had an experience of converting uh, chain lands directly to rice. So it's a learning curve, which I think we've done quite well. We're almost at 70, 80 percent of, of our projected yield. It's something that we're currently conducting uh, an analysis of what, <coughs> what we could have done better. And uh, hopefully in the next the next crop by March, you'll see a dramatic improvement. And I'd just like to, we have a few minutes more, I'd just like to um, respond to the question on what contractual opportunities. If you, if you could just revert and, and say what was the cost in developing those, the 200 acres of land at Wales, and what revenue did you gain from the CSAT so far? Well, I, haven't got those, I haven't got those numbers to hand, but I can always provide them in due course. And with regards to the contractual opportunities, one of the things we're looking at in the new business model, we have um, a shortage of attendance in terms of harvesters and planters at all of our estates. So what we're encouraging employees to do is to form um, businesses where they can provide us with services of um, harvesters and planters. So even many of the persons who um, may be made redundant come December, they can now form those um, planters and harvesting thing gangs and provide us with those services at the three estates. So that's one, the planting harvesting. We also have other opportunities in terms of drainage and irrigation, um, mechanical tillage, and uh, we have, for example, um, sewing uniforms. So hence, if we, for those persons who are interested in providing uniforms, we're going to assist them with training and tailoring and sewing so that they can provide us with those services. So those were just a few of the areas um, for the contractual opportunities. But I'll just like to add, actually, just to give an example of the opportunities we're talking about. 
I mentioned before we spend about $1.4 billion a year on the transportation of laborers into the back dam using private contracted lorries. Now that's an area if our um, employees who are being severed will want to go into, we will certainly welcome it. I mean, we'll probably go down to about $900 million a year because of the three estates going out. But it's a lot of money that we spend on labor transport. And you know, if, if employees can get themselves together and buy a lorry or two, we're certainly willing to accommodate them. It's quite a lucrative work, actually. This is where we'll have to, okay, we're going to take one more question, but we'll still be here after we can have one and -on one um, interviews with you. So we'll, um, we'll take one more question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, with uh, the with ten thousand or eleven thousand uh, thousand persons expected to be within the system by twenty twenty, what the labor cost is expected to look like uh, in that year, and how many persons will be made redundant in December? Mr. Suku. Um, Mr. Bim, uh, Mr. Bim, Mr. Bim, Mr. Bim, answer the cost. No, how, many how many persons are going to be made redundant? I think um, you can answer that. One. Currently, um, actually, we started the redundancy at East Dem uh, just this week. Uh, the forest phase at East Dem will see about 300 persons. and the end of the crop, you will see close to about the next 1,200 persons, uh, bringing the number to 1,500. And we're going to look at Rose Hall uh, to look at uh, rationalize Rose Hall between Blaymont and Albion. So that number reduced significantly. Uh, we're still working on that to see where we can place persons. Uh, we are looking at the establishment at Blaymont and Albion to see as far as possible for who we can keep to because we are looking to expand the operation at Blaymont and for who we can keep because there is some land at, at Rose Hall we are going to be utilized uh, for Albion. So the number at Rose Hall will be far um, reduced over the period. Um, it will be way below a thousand that will be severed at uh, Albion, um, at Rose Hall in fact. Uh, then we have the divestment of Skelton, uh, we will have to treat those employees also in total, which is close to over 2,000 persons. In terms of the, um, the labor costs, by the time all that occurs, um, we expect it to go down to about $13 billion per year. There's still a lot, quite a bit of work to be done in, um, on um, the severance issue and also the drainage ir irrigation as well. I mean, right now, we drain the whole of the coast, as you know. We spend an awful lot of money on fuel. That fuel bill I mentioned, a big chunk of that is for um, draining the communities around the estates as well as the East Coast West End. Um, there is a proposal at the moment for that to be going to go to the um, NDIA, but that's just been worked upon. But those sort of things have to be ironed out, so the labor costs might actually decline even further once those um, things are sorted out. That's, that's one clarity I want to make. Um, uh, while we have heard so much about strikes and work stoppages and the industrial relations uh, issue within Gaisuku, um, it's one of the most uh, challenging part of the business. Because I just want to put to you, I mean, you could check it. Uh, Gaisuku would have hundreds of strikes. It would have been one of the industry that had so much of strike across this, the, the, this hemisphere. Um, a day's strike, what it means to the company and the effect is not just the day's loss of work. It has compound effect on the material cane and the operation of continuity in the factory. So an operation where we have stoppage in a day on any estate or a stoppage a day or two, it affects the entire week because you have cane stale in, uh, inversion or loss of quality sugar from the factory. And, and this is where, that's a note that we would like to end on. And I'd particularly like to, to say that strikes, protests have been very disruptive to our operations. One of the things we've said in one of our press releases is that Gaisuko is in the sugar cult cane cultivation and sugar production business, not strikes and protests. And one of the challenges that we've ha been having, and particularly I would say with, with Gao, is, which is the Ghana Agriculture General Workers Union, is in terms of trying to, <coughs> to get the, the union to hold the corporation accountable without disrupting its operations. And so far we have not been successful in getting GAU to, uh, to hold us accountable 
without disrupting our operations. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for attending this press conference. To my colleagues at the table, I'd like to say thank you also for being on the panel and do have a good day. Goodbye.